Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, one quick note before we get started. You have Q&A cards that were passed out. Those need to be collected by 3 p.m. Uh, to be included in the Q&A. So if you have those, if you have a question that you would like to have asked, please make sure you turn those in by 3 p.m. So my name is Todd Fector. I'm the interim director right now for the new School of Arts, Technology, and Emerging, Emerging Communication. I'd like to welcome all of you for coming out, or thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, today we have a very special guest. Uh, John Carmack is the co-founder of id Software, leading uh, pioneer in the gaming industry. He's contributed to numerous 3D graphic innovations um, used in some of the largest game platforms, including Doom and Quake. He has a Lifetime Achievement Award, award in two, uh, 2010 for the Game Developers Conference Lifetime Achievement. Beyond games, John's a rocket enthusiast, co-founder and lead engineer of Armadillo Aerospace, and most recently he was named Chief Technology Officer of Oculus Rift. I'm sorry, Oculus VR, uh, where he's pioneering the virtual reality developments and applications. We're very fortunate to have John here with us today, um, and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce John Carmack. All right, hi, happy to be here. So I got a little bit of a tour to see some of the facilities and some of the projects that are being worked on here. Uh, I'm gonna spend time today talking more about content than I usually do since there's more of a media focus here. If anyone wants nitty gritty technical questions and answers, get them on the cards and we'll spend some time with it afterwards. So VR, especially in the current Renaissance, has this tie much more so than it used to to this uh, kind of hardcore gaming community where everybody has this vision that uh, we're gonna be playing first person shooters and stuff in virtual reality. And it turns out there's a lot of reasons why applications like that really aren't going to be the dominant things that people do, both from a specific game design standpoint, some things dealing with comfort and locomotion, and also just because what people want to do is going to be a lot broader than some of these niche games. And it's interesting where I can track back to the kind of the first wave of VR stuff in the 90s. And at that point, everybody was thinking all of these really abstract things that people are talking about, what's it gonna be like to be in the body of a lobster and silly weird things. And I laughed a lot back then and I was kind of derisive to a lot of the VR efforts that were going on saying that these are not focused enough on things that people are actually gonna care about. And it was premature in technology, but there were there were strategic problems with what was going on now. Uh, we are beginning to see now, in this current wave of interest and excitement, that there are a whole ton of things that people are, are really excited to do. Games are a large part of them, but we've even, we're even getting some data now with some of the analytics on Gear VR in particular that experiences, the things that people are doing in VR, whether they're panoramic photos and videos or watching movies or some of these other things that are not traditional interactive gaming experiences, are going to be at least half, if not more, of the, the time that people wind up spending. So uh, first, let me get a, a quick show of hands here. How many people here have used any VR headset in the last year or two? Okay, most. How many, let me uh, call this down, how many have used a DK2 level system? Uh, Gear VR. And how many people have used one of the, the latest trade show darlings, either a CV1 or a Vive or something like that? Anybody? All right, so the state of the art's uh, you know, a little bit better than what anybody here has, you know, has direct personal experience with. So the traditional way that all the demos are being done for high-end systems, certainly, is by using game engine technologies to build these experiences. And this is where you take a, you know, a Unity or Unreal Engine and you build content just like you were building a high-end 3D game. And then it's presented to you in the virtual reality headset. And all of the, the Oculus demos that we've shown on the Rift class hardware and pretty much everything everybody shows is built like this. And this is a, there's a huge industry in the gaming industry that knows how to build content like this but it's actually a really hard way to build a lot of content if you care about narrative or things like that. Uh, while we can all point to AAA titles that have wonderful narratives and engaging cinematic experiences and things that happen in it, it is uh, sometimes not obvious from the outside how wretchedly difficult some of those things are to build. And we had 
I, like we, Matt Hooper had made a presentation of some of the start of like the intro for the Rage, the last game we did at id Software. Just this little scene inside there where, okay, somebody zooms up on a buggy, gets out, shoots a bad guy, and there's some of this going on, a little tussle. And this is a straightforward scene that you would think just would not be that hard. And the title of his talk was, How Hard Could It Be? And he had something like 50 outtakes of all of the things that were screwing up terribly in the process of characters not going where they were supposed to do, animations freaking out, all of these missteps as it went through. And then the other part that's not obvious about that is when you're in a real-time game engine sort of environment, nothing is ever really in the can like you can be with a film sort of production where you can think you've got everything right, then somebody tweaks something else in the engine and all of a sudden your cinematics have broken. And there was a, uh, there was a rant a long time ago by uh, the head of Rad Gaming Tools, which makes, a, uh, which makes various compression tools. And of course, he had a vested interest in it, but he was basically talking about how so many game developers are just idiots for using their real-time system to build canned cinematics and remote camera views and things like that, where there is an appropriate tool for that, which is you bake it to video, and then it's in the can, it's never gonna rot, and you can always play it back, and it has constant performance characteristics and all of these other things. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of cases in virtual reality where we want a format like that, where you want to be building something that is an experience. It's a narrative or an exploration thing that doesn't necessarily use all the tools of game development, where you know, a game development engine, when you look at something like Unity or Unreal, it has millions of lines of code that are doing all of this stuff, like physics systems and AI logic, that may have nothing to do with what you're, what you're actually trying to build in VR. So we would like to have some kind of a format like this where you could build certain classes of VR experiences. We know they're going to be significant, whether it's you know, 20, 30, 50, or 90 percent of what users wind up doing in VR is really too early to tell. But unquestionably, there's going to be a large segment of experiences that people want to build that are uh, essentially pre-recorded, that you involve, your interaction is looking around or exploring, but not necessarily changing things as they're going on, where you don't necessarily have to be doing real-time ambient occlusion and changing your global illumination, all of these things that are really hard to do and very expensive in game engines. But there's a lot of trade-offs involved in doing this. Things that we have going right now, if you've looked at the best quality uh, kind of non-interactive stuff is right now actually happening on the Gear VR, surprisingly, rather than the higher-end PC uh, systems. And that's just because we have a higher resolution screen on it where we've got a 1440 cell phone screen essentially running the VR there where a DK2 is still a 1080p display. So the peak quality that you can get in just what you can see through it is on the lower end systems right now. But of course that'll be changing as displays move to everything else. Um, what we've done on here, we have static photos, just panoramic photos. We have uh, panoramic videos. We have stereoscopic panoramic videos. And we just recently got some of this ability to do high quality stereoscopic stills. And these are all elements in the solution space of what kind of content we can create that's not fully interactive. There's gonna be a lot of additional ways that these are integrated and playing where you can imagine taking static photos and having voiceovers and virtual tours and just crossfading between the different things, trapping, uh, changing over to videos in some cases, all these kind of multimedia things that people have explored in a two-dimensional space. A lot of these ideas get a new chance at life in virtual reality, how we can say some of these things that people might have done in the early days of the web with static imagery 10, 20 years ago are now potentially useful with panoramic imagery here. And there's opportunity for a lot of interesting creative things that, you know, that haven't really been explored and tapped out. But we are at this point now where all of the technical trades kind of have teeth in them and it hurts, where we can't get everything that we want. We can have some sense of you can work out the calculations of what resolution would you like to have in a display, what frame rates would you like to have, uh, what dynamic range. All of these are things that we kind of know what the limits of human perception are, and we're nowhere near them on most of these things for, uh, for virtual reality. And with a finite amount of resources, we have to trade these things off one against the other. So in media that we create right now, 
peak visual fidelity for uh, what we would do on a Gear VR is about a 6,000 by 3,000 resolution panorama. And we can make those static by making a few trade-offs, turning them into cube maps that we can sample directly and doing some of this pre-processing. And we can make a really good looking static uh, image. And in fact, I think that we are close to an important level of perceptual goodness with this because as we were developing this last product, I would go through building these panoramas and I started off with everything 4096 by 2048, nice powers of two that were GPU friendly. And I would still have like, our picky artists looking at this and saying, no, this is blurry, this is not good, I don't like it, it's, it's just not good enough. And when we made that step to kind of this one additional bump in the resolution and we're at these 1536 cube maps, which is about a 6,000 by 3,000 panorama, we were at a point where, okay, our, our picky, grumpy artist actually thinks these look pretty good. So that's a sign to me that there is a threshold resolution where almost everybody will kind of buy the quality at that level. It's important to know that that's still a long ways from the quality that you would want if you were just waving a magic wand. It's uh, a resolution of 1536 across a 90 degree field of view. That's about like looking at a maybe an 800 by 600 monitor, big screen monitor in the old days. So we could use several more doublings uh, before we get up to the point where you can say, well, this is as good as like looking at my TV set from up close. But we're at a point where, at least within reasonably memorable history, we were looking at media like this, and it's kind of okay. But the problem is, when we start getting to these other things that we want to do in virtual reality, which is motion and stereoscopy, that it is very, very hard for us to take even that minimum threshold, which we can just barely get now on static images, and say, well, let's now make it for full motion video at all this frame rate that we'd like to do. So we are currently making these painful trade-offs each time, where we have the option of doing stereoscopic video, we have the option of doing uh, you know, 4K resolution, uh, we have the option of doing uh, uh, potentially higher dynamic range in the future, and then we have frame rate that we can vary between 20, 24, 30, 60 frames per second. So ideally, we'd like to have 6,000 by 3,000 per eye stereo at 60 or 120 hertz. So this is a factor of 8 or 16 away from where we are right now. So you have to pick and choose. And these are reasonably divisible, where you do more or less get to pick this choice where I can be 4,000 by 2,000 at 30 frames per second, or I can be 2,000 by 2,000 at 60 frames per second, uh, or I can be 2,000 by 2,000 at 30 frames per second in stereo, and you can kind of divide these things out. So picking and choosing what you want there is one of the, the critical decisions. And each of these has important ramifications for the type of content that you do. So one of the, the important aspects that we've learned about comfort in virtual reality, because the, you know, the nightmare is always you wind up making everybody sick with your content. And there's things that we know do this, where if you have motion that follows a curved path, anything that's a sense of acceleration, your inner ear is telling you, I'm not accelerating, but your eyes are telling you that you are accelerating. And that's one of the major causes of simulator sickness and kind of discomfort with VR. So it is OK. So the, the safest bet for any of these things is to say, this is content built from a stationary viewpoint. It's perfectly fine to kind of make jump cuts between different things. But starting at a stationary point and then slowly accelerating up and migrating to another place, that's problematic. And you can get away with it for little cases, but the most comfortable, most conservative case is you say, what things can I do as if the viewer is essentially sitting in a chair? What things can happen around you? So that clearly limits the range of what you can do. And this was one of the things that Oculus has taken a, uh, an evolving position on this, where there was a period where Oculus was all about nothing but seated stationary experiences because we know anything else will make some set of people sick. And we're, you know, we're thankfully migrating a bit away from that, saying that, OK, we're open to doing other things that perhaps not 100% of the people are going to be comfortable in these things. But it opens us up to things that are more exciting and more things that people want to do. So baseline stationary behavior. The next thing that you can do that's comfortable for almost everyone 
is a linear path where if you are going at a constant velocity without changing your direction, that also doesn't mess with your inner ear of saying that you're accelerating. So you can have a, a scene that you're on a path, like on a train or something, or on a helicopter, going in a straight line. And that can be much more exciting and dynamic and interesting to look at than just kind of stationary waiting for things to happen. But an issue with that then becomes, if you're moving and you don't get exactly one new frame of video for every frame that is being updated on the display, it will feel like everything is juddering as it goes by. Because the way the modern VR displays work, the magic of low persistence that makes everything feel not like a blurry mess like the early DK1 class systems, is that it flashes the display for just a couple milliseconds, and then it turns it off and it's black for the rest of the display frame. That's important for making things not seem like, as you turn your head, the pixel smears across the entire distance. And that's why the first generation DK1s or any Google Cardboard systems, they look really terrible as you move around. You know? So you train yourself to move gently and slowly just so it doesn't look so terrible. But you know, if you do a quick whip around, then everything smears across it. Low persistence fixes that, but then you have this really hard duty to say you always update every new frame. You draw something different. And this is problematic because it means missing frames in your synthetic systems is then much, much worse. Where previously, if you were going at a chunky frame rate, well, it's a chunky frame rate, and it's, you, know, you know what to expect from that. But on a low persistence display, like a DK2 or a Gear VR, if you start missing your frame rate, then the whole world just feels like it's shaking badly because your brain is tracking over, but if the display doesn't update to where your brain thinks it's going to be, and it instead shows where it was 16 milliseconds ago, it just feels like your head is being jerked around. So this has an impact for how you do pre-generated media. It means that if you're not generating a 60 hertz video, in the case of Gear VR, or really annoyingly, a 75 hertz video in the case of a DK2, you're going to have these terrible judder problems on anything that's moving. It's not the end of the world if you've got a character moving across the screen. Most people aren't actually dashing across your field of view that quickly. If you've got a character moving and it's only updating at 30 hertz, that's generally OK. If something's moving really fast and you're tracking it with your head or your eyes, you'll see it kind of juddered and blurred, but most of the world would be OK. But if you're doing these moving scenes, then everything in the scene is moving, and you're almost, you have to commit to being at the frame rate of your display. So you go to 60 frames per second, which gives you this lovely, eerily smooth view. And in fact, I, like a lot of people comment how they don't like how video looks when you're shot at 60 frames per second or 120 hertz interpolated or some of these things. And people talk wistfully about the film look for things, which is this 24 hertz really juddering type of thing. But we've, we've convinced ourselves that that's what we associate with movies and cinematic content. But in virtual reality, you absolutely do want that sort of hyper real. Some people call it the soap opera look for shot on video. But that is exactly what you want in virtual reality. And the judder is a really poisonously bad thing. But right now, that means that you want 60 frames per second. That means instead of getting a 4K video, uh, you're dropping down to a 1440 video. Instead of uh, 4K by 2K, you're at you know, uh, 2560 by 1440 or something at 60 frames per second, because that's all that you can decode from these hardware codecs. And that is noticeably blurry, because if we go back to kind of the artist impression, even the full 4K resolution of 4K by 2K, or you actually need to go a slight bit lower than that, like I'm 3840 by 1920, but that resolution stretched across a panorama is not, you know, it's not the full quality bar that you'd want. It's already kind of blurry. Cutting that in half, you know, it takes it down to, okay, everything is eerie, smooth, lovely kind of VR motion, but it's now quite a bit blurry. Everybody's going to look at this and say, yeah, this is kind of blurry. Then the other axes that you want to do is stereoscopic display, where these baseline media contents are Everything is showing, it's showing exactly the same thing in the left and right eye. So your brain perceives that as you're in a very large area with everything sort of painted on a dome. There's no sense of things being at different depths relative to you. Now, in some ways, that's the most comfortable way to do VR. Because one of the things that's not always appreciated is when you do stereoscopic rendering and you have different views in each eye, 
Your eyes do the, the convergence and divergence to track on things, and that's one of the cues that your brain uses to tell how close things are, whether things are in front of or behind things. There's a lot of other cues, and you know, with one eye closed, you can still tell there's depth in the world because you're constantly moving your head around. But one of the problematic things in VR that we really have no, we don't even really have a solution on the horizon, is this difference between focusing and vergence. And that means that everything in the VR display is at a constant plane of focus. Mm. Uh, you can, on Gear VR at least, you can adjust it a little bit. Usually on the other ones, we try to make everything at nearly collimated, which is everything almost at infinity. And that's comfortable for your eyes. But then when you use the stereo disparity and you have your eyes change what they're seeing, your, eye, your eyeballs move in and out to kind of focus on that. But your brain has a problem because it expects to have to focus your eye differently as well. So this is one of the things that causes eye strain in both 3D movies and VR uh, glasses. And in fact, this is one of the things that the, director, uh, the directing choices that you make in a 3D movie, a lot of these are around some of this comfort, these comfort issues as well, where you will eventually get to some point where, and it varies from person to person, if something gets too close, then their eyes just stop fusing it all together and they see a double image, a ghosting. Often that's from not setting up the graphics correctly, but there will be a point for everyone where it gets so close that your brain's expecting it to be this blurry, out of focus mess, but it's still crisply focused, and your eyes just kind of pop apart and see, uh, you know, see it as two separate images. So stereoscopy is one of these wonderful, cool things when you're in VR, and there's that sense of there's something right in front of you, and you're, you know, you're peering around a little bit, or it's moving, and that sense that it's really there, that it feels palpable, that you can grab it with your hands, and that's a lot of the magic of the VR experience. But it, it's a two-edged sword there, where you have the, the issues that, one, it's definitely less comfortable for people. There will always be this focus vergence mismatch. And the closer you get, the worse it gets, and it makes it less comfortable. So these are things that need to be used either in moderation, uh, you know, always mining also kind of the upper limits for where it becomes uncomfortable for everyone. Uh, you know, or you have to kind of keep it out at further distances, either have it not going all the time or most of the stuff being more subtle. But when it becomes more subtle, then it's that other trade-off where am I willing to sacrifice half of my resolution to get this stereoscopic effect, which I don't want to hit people over the head with because it's going to start causing eye strain. Then there's the additional complicating factor with stereo video that there's fundamentally no completely correct way to capture in a static 2D image, even pairs of images, the 3D effect across all the different ways that you want to view it. So if you look at a 3D movie, the 3D effect is really only right when you're in one particular spot in the theater. And in fact, it's, you can go on for a long ways about the 3D effects that people do. It's not so much about making it look realistic, but it's often about making things pop out of the screen or, or fit behind it. But all of these are view dependent, where it works out okay-ish in a theater that even if you're off to the side, you're still looking at things roughly in the same direction. But if you made a VR uh, image or a VR video that was just kind of two cameras or even two panoramic cameras that are just sitting there capturing that, you would be correct stereo looking here, but it would get worse and worse as you turned until when you were turned completely around, it would be exactly backwards. And this is one of the, the horrible things you could do in VR is that if you ever make a stereo image that then tracks into opposite eyes, making people's eyes wall out, uh, go cross-eyed, uh, that's the type of thing that, that can give you a headache for an hour after you've accidentally done that to yourself. And you have to watch that from certainly from a, a user standpoint there. So I, the problem with the way we do this in VR, the current stereo VR uh, videos that we have, stereo panoramic videos, are done by building a you know, two pairs, it's still, you can have them top bottom or side by side, but it's this very special process where the stereo will be correct down the middle line that you're looking at for each of them. And it'll be correct as you go all the way around 360 degrees. The stereo gets less correct as you go further away from your field of view because we're only calculating it to be exactly right there. And the same row that's over there, when you turn over, that one's gonna be in front of you. So we can't make a thousand different views. That would be the optimal way if you had a completely different view for every angle that you could be looking at. That could be perfect stereo, but that would be prohibitively large. 
So we go through this fairly awful hack of sampling it so that it looks right when you're looking straight ahead, but you know, if your eyes track something over here, the stereo is going to be a little bit weird and probably not the best thing. But it's still a reasonably good trade-off for making uh, only half the bandwidth or half of the, the resources that you put in. But what it does completely wrong, though, is if you start turning your head at any way like this, then the stereo for what your eyes are seeing gets worse and worse. And that's, luckily, people don't tend to do that that much. Just like, it's the same thing in 3D movies. If you're in a 3D movie and, you know, you turn your head 90 degrees to the side, it'll hurt your eyes because everything will be going in directions that your eyes don't expect to track up and down for stereo disparity. They only expect to be tracking side by side. So what we wind up doing is this, this approximation going there, and then we also, importantly, have to fade out the stereo effect at the top and bottom because we've got this image wrapped around this sphere around your head, which means that if you keep looking up, you'll eventually be looking over and seeing part of what you would get from the camera looking behind you. And you get back to that switching the eyes around problem where if you had the full stereoscopics going up, as you look down, it would have this weird uh, problem at the poles, and then you would have backwards eyes going the other way. So the limits there for the stereoscopic projections here are that you don't get stereo effect at the top or bottom. So at the top, if you've got a sky overhead, that's fine, no problem. Uh, if you've got a floor, it does mean that if you look down here, the floor is going to look at the proper depth over there, and the more you look down, the floor will be more and more as if it was in the distance. It doesn't seem to be a huge problem, and one of the, the cases where the people that are doing real-world camera capture, they have this big multi-camera rig being set up there, so they usually wind up just blacking out the stuff at the bottom, which serves double duty for, uh, for avoiding that problematic area. Some of the stuff, like the Felix and Paul videos, I am on Gear VR. Some of them have used, and also on uh, the DK2 shows, they actually put 3D models in to cover up some of this stuff. So like you can put in a 3D model box, which is put in front of your stereoscopic capture. So I'm, there's this hierarchy of challenges going through and building these things. Normal panoramic photography is pretty close to, to settled right now. There are you know, there are high-end processes and productions that, that are doing this reasonably well, and it is fundamentally a solvable problem to build a monoscopic panorama. And we are just starting to see a wave of consumer cameras that are coming in that I think are going to sort of usher in the first generation of user-created content for panoramic, uh, panoramic experiences. So the Ricoh Theta is the first of these, where it's a like $300 little camera, and it is it's pretty much what you want in a consumer device. It's a little thing, two fisheye lenses. You can take photos and video with it. The photos are of almost decent quality. It's a 4K by 2K, but it's noisy at the sensor. Uh, the videos are, are much lower than what we want, where it's a uh, 2K video with 15 frames per second. So we want to be at eight times or 16 times better than that. But the exciting thing is there are a whole wave of companies that are making these cameras. So I think that uh, anybody that's interested in doing real-world camera capture stuff for, for VR content, the Theta is a great thing to buy right now. It's cheap. You can get kind of crappy video out of it, but you can take, you can take scenes, take shots, uh, do editing, build these things, and experiment about that, and start answering a lot of these questions about how do you direct a VR experience, which is you know, fundamentally different than, than what you would do for uh, a traditional 2D uh, video experience. Because we have 100 years of sort of experience now with the, the director and the cinematographer knowing how, what you do with a camera. You, know, you focus it over here, you zoom in, you pan over this way. And VR is going to be very different. It's going to be much more like, uh, like live stage or street performance or something where you can't force the user to look at anything. They're going to look wherever they want to look. And that's going to be a lot of the challenge about figuring out how do I draw them from looking over here to looking over there. You have to have things protrude into the view and lead them over. There's a lot that can be done with audio. Uh, but I think that people can be started on this right now. I think that the tools are, are good enough to be feeling these things out. But over the next six months, there's going to be a bunch of new options. So I feel good about saying that panoramic, monoscopic cameras is going to be solved this year. I think there's going to be some great stuff that will actually exceed what we're going to be able to display in the head-mounted 
displays. And of course, anytime you're doing something that's going to involve editing and composition, you want to have higher resolution source material than what you wind up deploying. And we are going to have 4K displays eventually and higher. So anyone creating media would be well served to create at as high of a resolution as you can, knowing that it's going to be sampled down to some of these very particular resolutions for the current generation. What's not at all worked out is this stereo capture, where there are, uh, there are companies like Jaunt that are trying to make kind of one-stop uh, plug-and-play stereo cameras, but the quality coming out of them are still nowhere near as good as what you get from these very painstaking production processes. Like the, uh, the videos that we ship with Gear VR, the, a lot of the Felix and Paul ones, most of those are done with similar rigs where you've got a dozen or more cameras that are capturing all of this, but there is a lot of manual production work that goes into it about making sure that I, this, you, you're always going to have errors in these where the cameras capture and overlap different areas. And with a monoscopic image, it's a, a question of like everybody's used to seeing these blurred areas in monoscopic ones, but at least fundamentally there, in theory, you can make a perfect stitch. And usually it's a matter of, uh, not having synchronized global shutters on the cameras or not having good physical alignment for it that causes these problems. But fundamentally, it can be solved. The stereo problem is much harder, where there really is no fundamental solution that's right for this. So you still wind up compromising. The directors are doing things like saying, OK, I know I'm going to have a bad zone here, so I'm going to build my set in a way that I'm never going to entice anybody to look at the area that doesn't look good. And that uh, kind of smoke and mirrors approach is, that's where a lot of the artistry and, and the creativity in doing these things is. Uh, and a lot of people will take a lot of, there will be a lot of uh, enjoyment from feeling out the limitations. And in fact, this is one of the things that I didn't really appreciate for the longest time about how limitations are, in many ways, one of the great goads to creativity. And we saw this in the gaming industry as we went through the first decade of all of this stuff was all about removing these limitations, you know, trying to get from you know, 2D to limited 3D to greater 3D. Uh, and it was only once we kind of got to this point where we are now, where you can do damn near anything you want in a game engine uh, with a little bit of effort, anything that somebody can imagine, you can do a pretty good job at. It's still going to be expensive to get, get all the assets, and you're still going to have to you know, pay attention to make sure that it, per that it performs OK. But there are essentially no limitations to what you can do there. And it's been interesting to see how sometimes this leads to a lot of flailing around on creative teams, where when you don't have those limitations and you can do anything, sometimes there, there's some negatives to it. So I'm kind of excited about the prospects in VR, where it's back down again to you have to pay attention to some of this stuff. With You have to pay attention to your staging for your resolution, how you set up your scenes. So there's some value to that. In, I mean, who knows, some small number of years we'll get to the point where we were really back to no real limitations and you can do whatever you feel like. But for the coming couple years, it is going to be important to choose your, pick your battles wisely as you kind of decide what you want to do in VR. The, I, those, but the stereo camera stuff is, is going to be hard. I do not expect, a, uh, like this year, a turnkey stereo uh, panoramic system to come out that does really high quality work across all of it. Samsung's got their project beyond that they're working on. Jaunt has theirs. There's a couple other companies that are working on this stuff. Felix and Paul has their internal stuff that, uh, that they're building the productions with. I, but I would not be holding my breath for, stereo, for having a quick, easy to use turnkey stereo thing. If you go down the stereo route with real capture footage, there's going to be a lot of struggles in the, the post-production phase. And there's going to be just challenges that you won't have if you're doing monoscopic. It's a little bit of a different question with synthetic imagery. And this is another fairly exciting area where this horrible format that we have to make for doing these stereo, the stereo footage, uh, and it's difficult even to for any kind of a rasterization image. Like we have some of these that were built, the, uh, the Pacific Rim video that came with the Gear VR was made by a, uh, it was a program that was originally a DK2 uh, kind of location-based entertainment thing. So it was real-time rendered in the Unreal Engine. And because there was no way that was going to run on a, a mobile phone in terms of that kind of, uh, that level of processing, they baked it down as a stereo panorama, panoramic video to run there. And that was a huge set of problems where they would make 
basically they were doing the same thing where they were making virtual cameras where they would set them up in there and they had the same exact stitching problems that people had with physical cameras. You had a little bit more flexibility if you could always throw in more cameras and make it easier and easier there at the expense of longer and longer times. But it's noteworthy that the team that did that, by the time they were most of the way through it, they were a post-production house, I mean a regular kind of film FX studio, and they were like, Ugh, if we had known it was going to be like this, we would have just rendered it in all in an offline, uh, an offline rendering program and ray traced it. Because if you're willing to ray trace the stuff, then you can just say, okay, this crazy panoramic video format, we can just turn this all, at, we can turn this into the mathematical equations of here's your interpupillary distance that we're simulating, here's how it has to fade off at the top and bottom, we're going to rotate it around, and we're going to make 4,000 rings that we render like this. And that actually works out pretty well. And we have, uh, at this point, we have the best quality static images that we've made, static stereo images, are made with um, Otoy's Octane Renderer, which uh, we basically, I gave them this little formula for here's how this stuff works, uh, and they've got a button now in the Octane Renderer that will just spit out a scene in this weird stereo, stereo cube map format for the stills. And these are currently the best looking things you can see through, uh, you know, through a head mount. It still has the problem of you can't move around in it, you can't tilt your head without the, uh, the optic, without the stereo getting worse. It's not right on the outside, but still it's these incredibly high quality, anti-alias pixels, lovely looking stuff. So I think there is an interesting possibility for doing synthetic work that comes out with the full stereo panoramic uh, stuff and getting the goodness of that. That's easier in many ways than doing the, the live footage capture. Uh, but you still have the problem of it's twice as much data, so you have to trade off your resolution and or your frame rate going forward. So uh, the trade-offs are, are tough there, but that's at least some reasonable direction. As we look towards the future, what we're going to have is some of these formats that are not just a conventional video that we decode for two different eyes and wrap around it. When we start getting sort of VR optimized formats, then we can start getting the best of all worlds. And when we have enough computing power to not have to make these bandwidth or compute trade-offs, there's two steps that we're probably going to take beyond this current stereoscopic panoramas, which is our current high-end media. Uh, the next step would be depth augmented panoramas, where right now the panoramas are either one sphere out in infinity or uh, a per eye specific view where if instead we had one sphere that's wrapped around everything and we knew depth information about it, we could then use the GPUs to kind of pull things in and out and render it. There's tricky things that have to be done to relax around corners so that if you've got an occluder and you actually like look over and you look past it, you need to know something to be able to draw there rather than just stretching imagery. But there's, there's good stuff that we can do from that. And I think that probably next year there will be a reasonable amount of work done for decoding scenes like that. Uh, things that you still can't do with that is it won't have atmospherics correct, it won't have uh, specular highlighting correct, uh, because it's going to be one single sample kind of baked into an image at that point. And, uh, and clearly if you move far enough, you'll, you've got some limited amount of depth overlap. But that will allow us to do the full comfort experience, where right now the panoramic videos, people that are very sensitive to VR, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's of note that the CEO of Oculus is one of the most sensitive people that, you know, that we've seen on VR, where lots of VR stuff makes him sick. So he's always about, it's got to be this perfectly comfortable experience, which is why we've had these synthetic demos through so much of this stuff, because those are the ones that even the most sensitive people can sit, watch, and, have, you know, and not have a problem with. But all of these video-based things, and there were huge fights inside Oculus about is video even a good thing to do because we know it causes discomfort on some people. We absolutely know going out that if you put the video stuff in here, somebody that tends to move their head around a lot, and if you've got things that are in the near field, their brain's going to be telling them. It's like, I'm moving my head and that's not responding because it's not re-rendering. It's a static video. And maybe it has stereoscopy and maybe that even makes it worse, the fact that your brain is telling you it's at that depth but it's not responding as you move around. But what we found is that there are at least a large number of people, probably the majority of people, can tolerate some of this stuff. And 
you know, it's not the greatest thing to say, but you train yourself not to do the bad thing. It's like, you know, doctor, it hurts when I bang my head into the wall here. So you just stop banging your head into the wall. And when you're watching panoramic videos, you just limit yourself to moving around like that. That's not where we want to be with VR. We want people to be able to throw this magical thing in front of you that you do the exploratory gaze on. And that's, you know, the real magic. But we're making trade-offs now. And that, of course, that's what engineering is all about. You, know, you don't just get to say, give me exactly what I want. You make the trade-off and say, well, we have pipelines now where there are people that can build these wonderful experiences, but they're not going to be fully synthetic. They're going to be baked into these uh, panoramic videos. And, uh, and we've decided uh, that this is a valuable way to do things, that there are huge bodies of work that we can bring in in existing panoramic photography and what people are, are beginning to do in panoramic video, that while it's not perfect VR, and you'll get some purists that are saying this isn't VR at all, this is not virtual reality, and I disagree with that view. I think that it's a continuum. I don't think that we have this clear, bright line of saying that, okay, with position track 90 hertz low persistence. This is virtual reality and everything below this is not virtual reality. You know, really we need to focus on what's the value to our customers. And it's clear that people are finding value in some of these experiences which are perhaps marginal VR. But we have this growth path for where these productions of offline generated content can be can bring in those things that we need about the position tracking for the, you know, for the complete level of comfort. So first with these depth augmented panoramas, but then where we're gonna go eventually is some form of light field rendering and storage. And this is again something that it's possible to do in reality where there are uh, elaborate rigs of many, many cameras that can be capturing things simultaneously that can then kind of back out what things look like from all different views and you can store that. And then with this captured rig, this captured scene, you can go in and explore you know, explore it greatly. Like the simplest case is you can have a window that you have a light field captured through and it's a static piece of data and it doesn't lay out just like as a two-dimensional image, but that window then you can look around, you can look up, you can look all the way to the side and only when you actually kind of break the bounds there and you stick your head past the window does the, the visualization start to fail. So if you look at these raw, this is an enormous amount of data. It's like gigabytes for a static image but it has excellent locality and excellent compressibility. So we are finding that it's hopefully looking like the light fields may wind up being actually smaller or roughly the same size than a stereo image because a stereo image completely duplicates everything. You have two copies of it that are slightly different there. So there's at least this possibility that light fields may be able to be structured to be roughly that size or possibly even better. Once you get that, then you've got this ability to look at things from all the different angles. You get the specular, you get the motion. You have, uh, you have real VR for those scenes. And you take these light fields and you make them all around it. So you would have a box kind of around your head. And the bigger you make the box, the more space it's gonna take up. So you pick some sweet spot. And at that point, you have that full magical VR experience about you can do anything there as long as you don't pull your view outside the box. And there's things that can be done extrapolating to not make it fall apart off a cliff when you hit that window. But you, know, you want to certainly make it so that people mostly stay inside there. So that's exciting. And we have, there are static versions of this running right now where you can, it's one of these, it's not there as a consumer product, but you can see the future in it. You can look at this and say, okay, well, we take this window, we wrap, multiply it six times, wrap it around the head, fix the seams. This is going to be awesome when it all works out. So I feel pretty good about that. But then to go ahead and say, all right, now we need that and now we want that at 60, 90, 120 hertz video uh, frame rates going through that, that's gonna be yet more time coming for that where I, we can probably make that happen on high-end PC systems right now, essentially. I, you know, If you stream, you have a big enough solid state drive and you're willing to stream uh, through a whole bunch of processing power, but it's gonna be a little while before we wind up having that level of quality in the mobile systems. But it is coming. I think it's inevitable that in a few years from now that we will be able to do light field rendered uh, VR experiences. And that will be very little compromises there. You'll have the, the full freedom of motion. You'll be able to do the great stuff uh, with the full comfort. But uh, that's still technology that's coming. And I think that 
People should be working right now with monoscopic things, figuring out how you want to direct things, how you want interesting things to happen, how you want things to change between them. And it should be a smooth progression between monoscopic video, stereoscopic video, depth augmented video, and then light field video, where these are going to be things that won't fundamentally change what you would do with content. It just makes it better. You know, it adds the, the sense of depth, the sense of presence and being there. But you could still wind up scripting and directing and doing all of those things uh, pretty much as you would even with the current most crude stuff. You could take a three minute video with a theta right now and it's going to be this blurry, blocky, low fidelity mess. But you could still prototype everything that you would eventually be doing some masterpiece four years from now in a, you know, in a light field renderer. So I think we've got a progression and we are very excited about kind of evangelizing this about getting media studies groups and all this, uh, these types of people and projects going to work on this because not a lot has been done. The idea of panoramic uh, projects and what you do there, most of them have been gimmicks so far. It's like, okay, we want to fly on a helicopter, we want to be on stage at a concert. So it's a real question of what are the right things to do here? And there may be other interesting trade-offs where right now we're encoding everything, but are there a large fraction of things that I, you know, like we have a company that's doing hockey games where they only record 180 degrees. Where you say, well, is that still real VR? If people, if they don't look past that, they get double the resolution in there versus stretching it across the entire area. There's cases where, well, what if we put a static image back there and we capture it? It's no good if it's a crowd of clapping fans, but right here, all of that could be a static image where we could have some live thing going on going forward. That's a reasonable thing to do. So there's a lot of these cases where we've got these factors of two. Factor of two for resolution, factor of two for stereo, factor of two for frame rate. Uh, there will be plenty of interesting cases where you can say, in fact, we're going to be building some example uh, media for this where I say, okay, I want to do the best possible pixels. I want to show the limit of what we could get on our hardware. So I'm going to use Otoy's Octane Render to build, a, uh, build one of these perfect CG offline rendered stereoscopic scenes. And then we're going to focus on an area like a 70 degree field of view in front. And I'm going to do stereoscopic CG offline rendered I am, you know, 60 frames per second video. And I'll say, OK, this is the limit of what our displays can push if you're perfect here. And let that be kind of a bar that you can say, well, do I want that? If I want that level of quality, it means I have to restrict the field of view here. Then you know, hit a key and you could say, well, here's what it looks at 30 frames per second instead of 60 frames per second. Would I rather get twice the, the field of view for that? Or here's what it looks like as monoscopic. So I'm hoping that I'm, you know, maybe in the next couple months I can make a demo application of this that just has all these different versions of the media and lets people kind of toggle through this. Because I'm saying all of these things here and most of you probably don't have a great gut sense of what, what does half the resolution, half the frame rate, stereo versus mono feel like. So I want to make that something that, that we can get out there and, you know, and get to content creators to say, here are your choices. We want to give you everything, but we can't yet. So you have to you know, pick some subset of these. If you pick all of them, then you're at one eighth the, res you know, the resolution. And you have to cut it down like that. Because it is time to start making some of those learning processes. So we say, what we find out in a lot of VR experiences, it's almost painful when we see people, they put it on and they'll sit here, you know, just like straight. And in fact, this winds up, the more sophisticated the gamer in many cases, if you have like a serious competitive game player, they have trained themselves to not move their head at all when they're watching content on a screen because it's actually not good to be moving your head while you're actually using a game pad. So you wind up with lots of cases, you show somebody this great new gaming VR headset and you wind up with their, they're just sitting there like this. And you almost want to like swivel their head or turn their chair or something there to make them do something. So. I, and in fact, this is one of the things that I, people laughed about it when I was saying this early on, but I think it's actually really important that one of the key advantages of the mobile VR, the Gear VR, is that there's no cables at all, that it's completely wireless. The fact that I, you know, I say swivel chair VR is a great thing because you can just do that and it's not uncomfortable at all. You're rotating around, you can look in all the directions and you can do linear movement while when you've got a cable tying you down, you know that's connected to your $2,000 PC over there and you, know, you don't want to go wrap yourself around and pull it off the table or yank the cables out or whatever. So it constrains what people wind up doing 
And yeah, you might as well not have 180 degrees of stuff behind you if you're never going to let people you know, turn more than they can in their chair. You know, there are some of these metrics about how you know, your eye can look about 50 degrees off center this way, and you can turn your head. It's uncomfortable to turn more than 30 degrees or so. so you can add it all up and say, well, maybe I really don't need more than 200 degrees. But that sense of freedom in a virtual world where you can look around and you can have awesome, amazing things all the way around you, so it's like you're you know, in the middle, you're immersed in all of the awesome stuff. That's one of the, the great things that we can do with VR. So uh, taking advantage of that, I think, is, you know, is a really good thing. But we've got the question about how do you convince the user to turn there. And I think that in many cases, especially early on, we're going to have to be clubbing users over the head with these blunt force techniques about, you know, you have the dancing firefly that just leads you over to look at something else over there. Because I think there's going to be a whole lot of frustration among content creators about how I'm doing something awesome over here. Why won't the users look at it? And we'll have to you know, log a lot more data with analytics and feedback so you can really track it, see what people are doing. I, one of the great things that you can do is using audio for a lot of these cues. And I had a great win with this just day before yesterday, where one of the, the projects that I'm spending most of my time on right now is sort of bringing this social element into virtual reality. And this is one of those things that a lot of people feel we need to prove out, because everybody understands how you want to go play games in there. But a lot of people don't quite see how this is going to be a social thing with all other people. So we've got floating avatar heads with voices coming out of them. But the important point is that the voice uses a very good 3D spatialization technique with it. So it's, it's an HRTF uh, transfer function so that you can, uh, your brain with earphones on can pretty precisely, like within a couple degrees, reference where a sound is coming from if it's processed correctly. And this thing that I was convincing myself that, OK, because we've only got this narrow field of view, it's at best 90 degrees field of view going here, even if you're sitting next to somebody, like we've got a movie theater and seating like this, if somebody pops in right next to you, they're not going to be in your field of view. If you're looking at the movie there and somebody is over there, they're probably going to be behind that. And I was figuring, I mean, yeah, we're going to have notifications, so so-and-so joined the, you know, entered the theater. But I thought I was going to have to do some kind of particle effect or something, you know, shoot out from there so that you see something fly into your view to cue you that you have to look over. And I was really happy uh, just a couple days ago where we were testing some of this and a bunch of people jumped in. So we had like five people in there. And I noticed that the spatialization, just from the ambient noise around their microphone, it, they popped in. It's like, hey, somebody is right there. And I could look over to them. And that was a surprisingly powerful effect. And it was somewhat unexpected there that just the little bit of ambient noise, clearly something just happened there. And I turned and looked, and it was perfect. So that's going to be. I, probably more powerful than I was expecting in terms of ways to kind of get users to move around and, and look at different things. But the problems with that is that level of fidelity, that perfect tracking of that, it's back to the synthetic versus the captured environments. And this is a theme that it comes back to over and over, where there are things when, whenever we bake a process down, we lose information. So the best that we've got right now for audio in our panoramic videos is a four-way binaural recording where uh, there's these interesting looking boxes that actually, they literally have eight plastic ears on them with microphones inside them. So they are recording what would be heard inside an ear from these four different, air, different directions. Uh, because interestingly, you might think that, well, if you're looking this way, aren't they the same audio as if you turn 180 degrees and you're looking the other way? And it's not true because the shape of your ear winds up you know, attenuating the high frequency uh, components coming from the back more than the front. And that's one of the reasons why you can tell something is in front of you. So this gets us something. And it means that if you're looking in the preferred direction, this again is coming back to the director has to do some of these things, knowing, OK, we've got a stitching seam over there, but we know our box is oriented this way. If we want the best binaural audio, it's going to be at these cardinal directions. We interpolate between them going across there. But that is not at all like the ability to track this fully synthetic uh, processed source, where the synthetic source is, you know, you can be tracking it. You can even, one of the major tests is I close my eyes and I hear the sound going around. And then when I open my eyes, I'm still looking straight at it because the audio positioning is that good. So you can't do that nearly as well with just sampling for binaural audio. It works at its best where 
If you're looking stationary, you can have the thing flying around you, and it will be high quality going around that. But if you're trying to get them to turn, it's not going to be as good, because in this intermediate area, we're just blending between the two different things going towards it. So eventually, we may wind up with some the sonic equivalent of light fields, where there are, are companies that have built these 64 microphone arrays, and you can start, recommend, start representing all of this as spherical harmonic waveforms or whatever. I, Maybe we wind up with something like that after people have sort of tapped out what we can do with uh, the current sort of binaural areas. But that's going to be interesting. Um, you know, a lot of, again, the, the really blatant ways to get people to turn around and look in there. You know, you want to have somebody going, you know, it's like, hey, follow me, and walking them around and doing some of those sort of scripted directorial things. But it's going to be interesting because we do find we're probably, to some degree, I'm probably overthinking the problem because we do find that for the most part, people watch these things and they kind of look at what's in front of them. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot of experiments about pulling them around, but there's a, a huge body of work that you can do with just knowing that you've immersed somebody in this world that's sitting in front of them, all this stuff can go on, and they will see whatever's there. And maybe you do something around the sides. But I suspect the first generation, at least, it's almost people will just hide joke lines or something behind them because 99% of the people won't do that 180 degree turnaround. But even in front of you, then, the resolution winds up becoming one of those issues where I hear people talking about, well, we're going to use really high end cameras to capture very high resolution. And it's important to realize that in the end, that's not going to help you when you're above the resolution of what your actual output display is. And you can make it worse by going to these lower resolutions where you need 60 frames per second or stereo. We had the, the people that did the, uh, the directing of the Cirque du Soleil video, which is one of our best quality videos. That's 30 hertz stereoscopic. So it's half the resolution of the monoscopic videos. And everybody's generally pretty happy about it. But they still say, well, you can only get the people. You can only really see things when they're a couple meters away from you, when they're in this very close area. And beyond that, it's really blurry, and you can't make out much. And that is this painful level where we do see some people that say, oh, there's this interesting split. If you read forums on people's responses to these videos and what people think about them, you'll see you would almost think that people are looking at two completely different pieces of content. Because you will have two people say, one person say, this looks amazing, this is great. And another person say, this looks like garbage. And they can be looking at the exact same thing, just depending on what they, what they feel is necessary. So we are at a level that's acceptable to some, but clearly not acceptable to everyone. I mean, there's, I don't think that they're, I think they're giving real opinions when some people say, uh, especially if someone coming from an art or film background could look at one of these stereoscopic videos that has the blurriness and compression artifacts in some cases and say, this looks like garbage. I mean, but it is, it's like web video from 10 years ago. This is something that it's not great now. It's not what you can, what you would hope to get, but there's a clear progression path for where we're going. But it does mean if you're building something that you expect people to look at like this year or next year, there's a clear set of, you know, we know what the display resolutions are, you know, are going to be through you know, through this year and next year, and everybody that's going to be having a VR experience is going to be on something that is a 1440 or lower resolution display. So that has very strong uh, considerations when you figure out what the tightest resolution is there. If you want something to be happening, if you want to be able to convey emotion in some person's face, they're going to have to be reasonably close. And then you start getting into the, the trade-offs on stereo, where there's this sweet spot where they're close enough that the resolution is decent enough that you can actually read something from someone's space. But, I, you know, but not so close in the stereo case where you start having some of the stereo convergence problems. And it's going to be interesting to feel out some of those things where you I, they hit them over the head 3D effects, which some people will want to do when you have something kind of go right by your face to say, look, 3D stereoscopic. I, but that's going to be the, the discomfort issue. So again, trading off. Comfort, resolution, stereoscopy, frame rate, all of these things over and over again. Uh, so the simplest form of content is a static video, where you just say you have something, whether it is a video, a stereo, any of these, this whole range of things. But you start it up, and you, you get it running, and you play. And we expect that 
we're hoping to bootstrap an ecosystem for this where we have a whole content pipeline that you know Facebook is involved in this where we want to have this we want to make it easy for people to take just your your candid little user generated content and scale that up to the high production quality stuff that we're spending quite a bit of money on on the higher end I uh, but being able to go from I uh, you know from the simple stuff there what we want to do is we start feeling out interactivity where there's the scary cliff when you get into fully synthetic where you say okay it's now a game engine game and for all the games that you know that we love seeing a lot of these have hundreds of millions of dollars of budgets going into them i mean in a lot of cases rendering something for a game engine is going to be much much more expensive and time consuming than doing things even in traditional filmic ways so it will be interesting to see if there is a useful intermediate ground with things where the, again, it goes back to what people were doing 10 or 20 years ago when video was something that you couldn't do great. Do you do you know, intermediate things where you have some little interactive thing there, choose your own adventure path, things that fade in or out, uh, things that you know, have different static backgrounds mixed with the video backgrounds, and we don't know where this is going. We have some, peop some effort is going into looking at these things. Right now, pretty much everybody winds up building a Unity project uh, to do the experimental video things and the engineer in me you know just winces at that where you know you're dragging in hundreds of megs and hundreds of millions of lines of game engine code that's built for doing these game engine things just to do a to draw a box on top of your panoramic video and it works and if you you know if you're comfortable with these you know working at these things then it may be the best tool for the job but i still i personally feel that there is that there is an intermediate level of engineering that we can do that allows us to do a lot of these things, mixing static objects with the dynamic video, doing fades and teleports and different sort of scripted level things without hauling in the entire baggage of a full up, you know, a full fledged game engine. Because one of the other aspects of that that we've, um, that we have to deal with is right now we're pretty exclusively equal rectangular full panoramic videos what we get asked all the time well can we have cylindrical videos like you can make with more easily with your phone there there's a few new cameras like there's a, uh, a v360 camera that takes a, re a much higher resolution video and it can live stream but it's 360 degrees but only a subset you know a subsection vertically so there's, uh, and there's other cameras that have all but like a small bit at the bottom and a lot of these different things. Or you'd like to be able to use just a GoPro and say, well, the GoPro can give you 140, 140 degrees or something, which is potentially interesting right there where if people do mostly just sit and look forward, you know, with a little bit of tracking around, even a GoPro uh, will cover pretty much the field of view there. Maybe you just need a little cockpit view or something around that. So I think there's... There's interesting potential for some of these uh, cutting corners approaches where if you say, well, I want peak quality or I want peak frame rate, I, I'll figure out some way to limit the video to the smaller sections of the screen while doing static things or doing other things. Or maybe we even have trivial interactions. I mean, yes, it probably winds up eventually making its way towards using the full-fledged game engines where even if you only need the equivalent of 50,000 lines of their code, if it's 50,000 lines, you don't need to write yourself. Maybe you don't mind carrying 3 million lines of code you don't need getting, you know, coming along for the ride. But there are subtle things that, that, uh, that matter right now. At the best technical level, when you're really trying to eke out quality here and you care about being, uh, you know, you want to be closer to the codec levels, not going through some random plug-in, most of the work right now is cobbling together random things but as we professionalize on this there probably will be a level of sort of technical director in a lot of these projects that either makes it work at the best possible level that it can in unity or works with some slightly lower level native code but all of that is kind of in the works right now and is uh, a lot of the effort that's going on uh, it's not clear how much of this can be done with uh, script level type things i think that in the near term uh, we are pushing towards unifying a bunch of this stuff where you run into this mess where we have three Felix and Paul videos that ship with Gear VR, and it's kind of stupid right now. Each of them is a separate application. You know, these are basically video things that, that do panoramic audio, panoramic video. Maybe they draw a box in there or do some other cutting or fading or a different pause menu, and they were all separate applications done in this kind of cut and paste uh, copy the project over, change a few things. And that's the way a lot of things get done at a creative level, but 
it's, you know, it's not great from an engineering level. And we are certainly hoping to be able to unify all of that and provide these tools where people that want to do different windowed video players or uh, you know, putting video in a specific subset window or integrating with some other things that we can get by there. And we're still struggling, or I'm struggling, with what level of abstraction you want to put in there. I think that if we just do mixed static models with, um, with video, offer fades, uh, as one technical point, I, you should try never to fade anything actually baked into the video in a VR thing because it's terrible for compression, for one thing, where if you actually fade inside the video, every frame is changing and you get lousy artifacts or bit rate there. But it also means that you can't then mix it with something else without trying to match that faded information. So we're trying to encourage everyone now, build everything at full brightness, and then let the GPU go ahead and integrate some point fading down video with anything else. All right, looks like I'm getting the uh, getting ready for questions warning. I didn't know you were going to stop talking okay. entirely. I until you got up here. I made that long walk. Okay. Um, yes, I do. We do have quite a few. Um, let me just start off with this one. Um, which is more important uh, for VR, stereoscopy or motion parallax? So this is something that you will get different, different opinions about, and it's, it's fairly contentious. So, there is a, an internal project, fairly high profile thing that I can't talk about, unfortunately, that I, I was doing it on Gear VR where you don't have a whole lot of performance. So the big hammer in terms of performance that you can do is say, well, I'm going to stop rendering stereoscopic. I'm going to render monoscopic. So I did that and it's running great. And I'm showing it to like all the executives at Oculus. And you know, I had mentioned that uh, I've got a, a mono mode and a stereo mode. And they're trying this and like, wow, this is pretty good. I wouldn't want to try it in mono, though. I said, you've been playing it in mono. So even like the people most immersed in the VR industry here don't necessarily notice the absence of you know, monoscopic. So I would say that I, if I had to pick between the two, definitely pick parallax. The subtle little motion of just the head neck model about your eyes moving the couple of inches and getting the slightly different view, that winds up being more important. Stereo is. Stereo adds that, that wonderful sense when you've got it set up right, something is in the near field and it's just sitting there. Stereo gives you that it's really there, I'm there with it feel. But a lot of the time when you're in VR experiences, you don't have things in exactly that sweet spot. And it does cost almost twice as much to render the stereo views and twice as much power and thermal on mobile. So we try to encourage everyone to to keep your scenes simple enough. We don't want people to make that compromise. If you're building something from scratch for VR, use good creative discretion and build something that can render 60 frames per second stereo, never drop a frame. We, we are fairly confident that that is the right decision rather than rendering twice as many polygons and falling back to monoscopic. It's only a problem if you're starting with an existing project that you can't necessarily change everything in. If you're making a VR version of something that you're not building from scratch, Maybe you make that change of dropping to monoscopic in some cases. From scratch, design simpler. OK. What inspired you to get into VR in the first place? And I'm going to combine this with another question of, and why is your focus, your personal interest, more in the mobile platform? OK, so you know, VR is one of those things where I made this comment many, many years ago, where as you're doing 3D graphics and getting into it, this sense of building the holodeck or the metaverse, I said it's, it's a moral imperative. That's the, the real genius line there, where just as an engineer, you just feel like we can do this. This is the future. This will be so wonderful. We can enrich the lives of everyone on the planet with, you know, with virtual reality, replicating the wealth that's a, that few people get in virtual form across larger stuff. There's, it's a very, very powerful draw. As, as an engineer that knows most of the pieces necessary to do that, that sense that I can do this, it's really valuable, I should be working on this. And I, you know, I have to make tough decisions about all of this stuff where I, I basically shelved all the aerospace work, which I've been working on to say I need to focus full time on this because I can't keep splitting my focus between you know, aerospace and graphics and family. It's like something's got to give. And 
you know, Elon Musk kind of needles me every now and then about how I need to be working in, you know, in aerospace, and I'll probably go back to it, but it does feel very powerful right now that this is a time when something really important can be happening and something that can touch, you know, I, I want to have a billion people use VR in the not that distant future where we have billions of people with cell phones now, and this is why I think that the mobile side of things has been my priority for this is there's a path that takes us to a billion people using virtual reality. And that's not going to happen with the high-end stuff. High-end stuff is great. I mean, I love crazy high-end graphics cards and hardware and custom optics and displays. And all of this is wonderful. And, you know, I'm happy that Ferraris exist. But I think that more impact is going to be made on the world by things that the vision that I have for the mobile stuff eventually is, yes, right now, Gear VR is a, a $200, you know, kind of premium product for the highest in phones that Samsung sells. But it does not take a lot of imagination to see that what right now is only in a Note 4 or a Galaxy 6, that it won't be too many years before the $50 phone being you know, mass produced by the hundreds of millions has all of those capabilities and you wind up slotting it into some $50 or less holder where you come out of the cell phone store, you buy your cell phone, you buy your cell phone case and you pick up a VR holder for it. That's a world that I can imagine happening in the not too distant future. And I think we can deliver an immense amount of value inside those sorts of constraints. And that's what we're building right now. Somewhat related. How much of an impact do you think VR will have on the aerospace industry? So there is a, there's an interesting tension between, uh, like on the space side of things, you do wind up with camps. And it usually breaks down on like human space flight, non-human space flight, or scientific probes and things like that. And there's an argument that people will make. It's like, well, we'll send our probes to the moon and Mars and the asteroids, and everyone will be able to just experience that through, you know, through virtual reality. And I would say, yeah, that's going to be great. But I, you know, there is still that push for people actually wanting to do things themselves. Like, you know, I've been on the, I've been on the zero G uh, airplanes where doing those things, and I'd love to go to space and the moon and all this stuff. And virtual reality, we're not going to be able to simulate gravity virtually in there. There are things that we fundamentally won't be able to do. Now, the professional applications of virtual reality, like how do we use them for CAD, CAM, uh, designing work and uh, building things like that, that's where. I think VR tried to push into niches like that because it was so damn expensive. You know, you had these cottage industries as things flamed out and collapsed and didn't live up to promises in the 90s. You had all these places where, like, who can afford $50,000 uh, VR headsets? NASA can afford $50,000 VR headsets. So you wind up with a lot of work being done, kind of shoehorning things into uh, other areas there. And I honestly don't think that they're necessarily great fits. I think the exact thing that we want, that VR wants to do, is take most of the people in the world to all the places they'd like to be at and do the things that they'd like to do, but they can't because of physically constraining reasons. So I think that while I, the consumer stuff is already better than almost all of the professional grade systems, and we are going to wind up displacing all of those little cottage companies, and we will have specialized resellers. And we saw all this exactly with, gra with GPUs 15 years ago, where I used to love the fact that you could buy silicon graphics and Evans and Sutherland image synthesizers, and you know, that you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on this. But you know, 3DFX and NVIDIA, they murdered all of those companies because the consumer hardware that you used for playing these frivolous games wound up being the technology driver for that. And I think it's absolutely going to be the case in virtual reality, where the pull of millions and billions of people using virtual reality will drive all of that. And everything else is going to be gravy that's going to ride on the coattails of it. OK, this one, we stepped out to look at these questions. And you may have already covered this a bit more than uh, with regard to the challenges, the visual challenges in VR, can you talk more about the challenges and places for improvement in terms of audio? Yeah, so the audio stuff, we have, uh, we have a great audio team at Oculus now. And this is my current battle that I'm fighting is we know that with headphones on, with this good HRTF uh, tracking and with the binaural audio, we can make a really good audio experience. And it matters a lot. The thing that I'm stressing a lot about is that Gear VR, uh, you have to plug in the headphones. So you have to plug it into the, head, uh, into the headset there. And 
people don't plug in headphones very much if you don't make them. Uh, the argument that I would make is do a YouTube search for Oculus Rift and count the fraction of people that have headphones on. And it's like 10%, which is scary from an audio standpoint because if you get very low attach rate for the exact audio that you want, it means you're not, it's not going to pay to optimize for that. So I really hope that a future rev of Gear VR, when we're really going broad with consumer, has some kind of integrated audio. You know, we've, we've had suggestions for maybe retractable earbuds, but what I really want to see tried is putting little speakers that are ear-facing speakers on the headset. It won't give you privacy where people will hear what you've got, but I think that we can actually do, we can put in the in-ear microphones and we can capture the exact HRTFs for that system. So I believe that we can deliver equally good spatialization for something like that while still being this self-contained unit that, I, that is still robust and doesn't have you know, fragile little ear flaps or a tangled mess of wires to get into. So it's important, but it's only important if we can guarantee that most people have it. And this is the tragedy of the audio designer in, game, in the games industry, where in my career twice I've gone and worked towards very high-end audio synthesis stuff doing things like HRTFs and all this DSP synthesis. And each time, it was determined that, damn it, it's just not worth it. Because so many of our people will have speakers that are backwards or put in the wrong place. Almost nobody will have headphones on. And all of that fancy stuff, even if you're turning your head, it isn't exactly right. VR is the best opportunity for audio to, to really take steps forward and prove its value in a way it's never been able to in digital entertainment. So. I am really hopeful for that, but I am concerned about uh, like headphone adoption rate on mobile at least. Okay, how important do you think eye tracking in VR is to assist with focus divergence and or maintaining presence um, and or social agency? Okay, so on the social side, this is again something I'm work working on right now. So we have little floating heads and they have synthesized eyes in them and it turns out it's one of these things, it looks great right now, but it's all synthetic. They have blinking and they have tracking where it assumes if you're looking at somebody else, you're gonna keep eye contact with them as long as you move like 20 degrees off side. And then you know when you move further away, then the eyes move over and you could look at somebody else. And that works really remarkably well. I had these people that were putting it on saying, wow, the eye tracking is great. And somebody else said, we don't actually have eye tracking. So the social side of it, I think, I, I think we can solve synthetically. And in fact, I have some interesting uh, thoughts about how we should in many ways be able to make our avatars more sociable than the people are in real life. I mean, I want us to like go, we've got psychi psychologists on staff at Oculus and I want to task them with this and say, it's like, what is the best way we can make some person's face behave? You know, the widening of the eyes, the tracking of the, uh, the eyes and little things with like, when do people blink relative to your conversations or do we do, we can do some of these things synthetically to probably make people better than they are in real life. So the social side, I don't think we actually need the hardware for that. Where the hardware is particularly interesting though is for moving foveal rendered regions where right now we're already at this awkward stage where it takes a lot of performance to render these stereo high frame rate uh, VR views and as we get 4k displays it's going to get even worse and again we want resolutions that are several times that you know we would like 16k displays as you know that's kind of what you would be at close to a retina level display if you have a 16k display driving your VR so we're a ways off from that but if we get there and we say, well, all right, now how do we render all of that? And then even more important, how do we get that over a cable or a Wi-Fi link unless it's all built into the headset, in which case then you're using mobile class stuff and you're back to how do I render all of that? So the solution would be if we had really great eye tracking, then your, your fovea only images about a two degree field of view. It's this tiny thing that's just constantly moving around and we have to render so that's like four, you know, four degrees square that you have really good focus on. And we're rendering hopefully like a hundred degree square, uh, you know, a 10,000 degree square region of everything that could be much, much lower resolution. So if we had great eye tracking and we had great feedback on the synthesis rate, and it's not clear how much we need, where our, we're doing great right now. It feels real when you're under 20 milliseconds, motion to photons, when you turn your head like this, and if it gets you a new image within 20 milliseconds, that's pretty good. We can push it down more, and it gets a little bit better, but that's, that's a fairly important line. We don't know what that is for, uh, for the eye tracking. Would it be, 
I'm worried that it would be that if you just track 20 milliseconds, our current latency for that, and you're jumping around, it would just, everything would look blurry because your eye has already moved in the 20 milliseconds before you finally deliver the pixels for it. But maybe we do wind up with something, I mean, heck, we may wind up ray tracing stuff like that eventually. There's different architectures. But the fact that you have this, I am, you know, this factor of many hundred difference between what you have to render if you're doing it brute force versus what you would do with foveal tracking, that's gonna be a big push for it. Right now, we're at this, you know, this level where it's reasonably comfortable, where we have about as much software overhead as we have for the rendering of all of this, and we can trade it off reasonably. But the displays are going to probably advance faster than the amount of pixels that we can render, certainly in a mobile sense. So eventually, that may be important. But right now, we do not have even a lab-grade system that we think is good enough to do that I'm, you know, at any price right now. But some work is ongoing. I confess I don't quite understand, but that's okay. Uh, is the Magic Leap tech commercially viable? And do you suspect oscillating fiber projectors will allow them to be a strong competitor for Oculus? So, I don't know. I haven't seen the Magic Leap stuff. I, all of the augmented reality stuff, when you look at Magic Leap or HoloLens, I, one of the problems is, and Google Glass did this kind of horribly, where they sell a vision of, I mean, I want augmented reality where I see everybody's name floating over their head and so I can remember people that I was introduced to 10 minutes ago. And you want to be able to have, you know, click up and bring up their CV or whatever next to them. I mean, all of that's going to be great and everybody on earth is going to want this. It's going to be a personal superpower. But these vision videos that people make of this where it's a statement of like we want this to be like the future they don't really represent what the reality is and so again i haven't seen magic leap but i will be surprised if it's a full field of view augmented reality display and see-through augmented reality is much the hardest problem relative to pass-through augmented reality or virtual reality because i mentioned this 20 milliseconds number and if you're at you know, and Gear VR is usually 16, 18 milliseconds, something like that on most of the things. And at that point, it feels like you're looking around in the real world because there's no sense of shear and reference. But if you have 16 milliseconds of latency on a pass-through, on a see-through system, you can see the real world, which has zero milliseconds of latency. And even if you're at this damn good 16 milliseconds range, as you move your head around, it is going to be directly proportional like they always show, like you want to show, okay, the elephant in my hand or something on the table, but it's going to look, when you're, st when you're steady, it can be rock solid there. There's still issues with how well you could filter out. It's, you can only add on, not take away from there. So there's a lot of other challenges, but the basic idea of you could look down and see this awesome thing there, but as you move your head around, everything is going to move. There is going to be some amount of movement that happens there, and that takes away some of the, you know, the wonder of the perfect system there. There's still, it'll be great for floating name tags and things that are not tied in, but when you want something, a creature crawling across your system there, you can do that in theory perfectly with pass-through augmented reality, like all of the terrible augmented reality games you get on mobile where you hold your, your phone or your tablet up and you see things. And I've yet to see one of those that I actually think is, you know, is good. They're, it's more the it's, you know, it's amazing that the bear can dance at all. The bear doesn't actually dance well. You can see it that, yeah, it's kind of neat that I see that, but it's pretty terrible. And just all of these metrics that you'd want with responsiveness, with tracking fidelity and registration and all that. So it will absolutely come, but I think that virtual, immersive virtual reality is by far the more practical near-term system. Can you talk some about the connection, your vision for the connection between virtual reality and uh, human-computer interaction, HCI? So the most important thing that's really happened in recent years, the advent of touch computing, I think is the notable thing about that is touch is the most intuitive way of interacting with things. And we talk about intuitive a lot in user interface design, and you don't get a better uh, demonstration of this when you see like a two-year-old using an iPad, you know, just putting down, that's amazing, you know, that, I mean, that is really a breathtaking accomplishment in human-computer interaction. So virtual reality is the converse of that, where touch is the way that you affect things in the computer world. Uh, virtual reality is the way that you take information in, because just as the most natural way to affect something is to push on it with your finger, the most natural way to get more information is to gaze at it. To be able to just look around, that is literally the most natural thing in the world. That is what people do. You touch things and you look at things. You track them around and you follow them. So 
being able to, we don't know what the best user interfaces to take advantage of this are yet. And just like we had generations of you know, mediocre games, and I made some of them where you're basically taking an old game and saying, hey, I've got it on touch now with virtual thumbsticks, which is, of course, a lousy way to, you know, to use the medium. It's better than, you know, not having anything, but it was only when you started getting people doing things like, you know, Angry Birds or Cut the Rope, where you're using the touch as an analog device, where you're using direct manipulation across it rather than using it as virtual buttons, that you wound up getting the big win. And I don't think we've seen that big win yet in virtual reality, where we have... You know, like I, I felt, you know, I was pretty disappointed with our first uh, sort of official home user interface uh, for Gear VR because it's basically like it was designed for a TV set. You know, it's sitting right there. But, you know, with limited time, do what we know and, uh, and make it work there. There has to be some value to the virtual sense of you want things that, that go off the edges of the screen because you don't want to spend a lot of time like looking with your head tilted, that's bad ergonomics, but you want to be able to glance over and say, I want that. Glance over, pull the things back around and work with you there. There's, uh, there's some subtleties to that though where, uh, like we had some demos of big fields of stuff stretching off like movie titles or applications running off both sides. And that looked really cool. You look around and you could spin it forward, but then that becomes one of those comfort issues because if you're occupying a large fraction of your field of view and you spin things past it, it's again your brain going, am I spinning or is the world spinning? And there's, you know, you're on a little bit of shaky ground there. So we don't know yet where we're going with that. I am. One of the interesting things about it is when we get to probably the next generation of displays, when we get 4K in there, it becomes, it becomes starting to be reasonable to use them as display replacements. Where I get asked all the time about, do you, have you actually programmed in virtual reality? And no, I've spent time trying to make the best possible displays of text in virtual reality for, uh, you know, for some of the applications that, that we've got where I do special stuff in the time warp shader to give as good as possible. But as good as possible right now still isn't good enough for text. It's like, you know, it'd be like programming on a, an old 800 by 600 monitor or a really bad laptop. And yes, you could have multiple virtual screens there that you could slide around, but it's still not a winning combination. People will do it for the novelty, but it's not, uh, it's not objectively defensible. One more step and it will start to be. It would be like you had a whole bunch of 1080p monitors pretty close to you. And the optics still won't be great, but it'll start to be interesting. And at that point, if you have a lightweight, really portable uh, VR headset, then uh, that maybe will bring, like I hate working on a laptop when I'm used to my two 30-inch monitors there. So you know, for that type of situation where you may have a keyboard that you have with it and actually using a keyboard, and maybe we need removable light blockers at the bottom so you can still see that unless we can get to the point of tracking fingers and keyboards perfectly well inside the virtual space. But that's going to be another interesting point. So I don't think we've seen the winning combinations yet for how it's going to be improving human-computer interaction, but I have no doubt that it's going to be out there. Because at its worst, at the very worst, as our displays advance, you can put a normal 2D computer display screen there. So our fallback case is to just do what we've always done and wait till the resolution catches up there. But there's got to be better things that we can do. I mean, how do you do notifications at the, at the upper end of your field of view or something rather than popping up on a limited space in your desktop? There has to be things that we do knowing that you can glance off, that you can pull in information slightly there, running things off the edge of the screen. So I fertile ground right now for somebody to make an important breakthrough that sort of sets the tone for interactions, you know, for decades in the future. You once said that story in a game is like story in porn. Do you still feel the same way? Oh, yes, it's unfortunate that quote keeps getting dragged, uh, dragged <laughs> dredged up out of history. But I do still more or less defend that point where this comes to the point about interactivity versus narrative. And for me, while everybody has a favorite game that they think combined interactivity and narrative perfectly, I do think there's a fundamental tension there where a, you know, a perfect movie or a perfect book is in many ways a, a carefully crafted jewel from the author, director, and production team there where this is what they've built and this is what they care about and they don't want you to go and make some random other decision there. And I think most of the most of the uh, experiments in truly interactive narrative have been failures. There really aren't that great many successes there. And even in games where you have potentially multiple narrative paths, there is cruel pressure to reduce that because 
it is expensive to build paths that people don't go down. You know, if you're spending $100 million on something, you want to make sure that everybody that buys that game kind of experiences that path. So, I, I mean, I've spent all, pretty much all of today talking about uh, the non-game side of things because everybody knows, we know we're doing games. Games is going to be in the neighborhood of half of what we do here, but I do think half of what we do in VR, maybe more, is going to be non-game things. I think they are going to be things that that may have narratives, that, you know, that may have stories that you present in a way that doesn't require interactivity. Interactivity is great, but you don't need it everywhere. And if you look at the numbers, there's still, you know, people still spend more time vegging on the couch in front of uh, Netflix or something than they do spend playing interactive games. That's just in the human condition. I think there's a lot of that where people don't necessarily always want it to be interactive. And then when you want to be told a story, you want to hear the story, you know, the, the way the author intended in most cases. I mean, maybe afterwards you reuse all of those assets and you build a game, but I think that the, the story part, in fact, I think that's an excellent way of doing things, either one way or the other, is that you build two projects. You build something that does have a narrative, and then you build something that is exploratory and interactive. And you don't want to necessarily build all of the resources twice and build two completely different things. And in particular for VR, I think that the only way VR is going to have AAA content in the first couple years is by leveraging content that somebody built for something else. So I think that you build your VR exploratory version of something that was either you know, made for an interactive game or you render VR scenes and VR videos out of things that were done for offline CG rendering for movies. What's your current stance on functional programming, static typing, and using Lisp, Haskell, and production? So, uh, yeah, this is a, a very current topic for me right now where I've gone through this you know, learning process as a programmer for, you know, professional programmer for 25 some odd years now. I am, and, you know, of course, I came up in the imperative programming stuff with basic Pascal, C, C++, and that whole line of things. And several years ago, when it's interesting when you get into these long-term projects, like it did software, these projects were dragging over many years, and you kind of have a little bit more time to reflect at the, okay, here's these millions of lines of code that, that I or we have written over this time. What are the things that cause us problems in engineering? What are the maintenance issues? What things wind up biting you on releases? What things are found by you know, static analysis? Uh, different things that can be found automatically. So I, you know, I went through a, more of an engineering focused phase in uh, maybe the last five years or so, as I've spent more time on some of these other things, how we can look at the craft and process of programming. And one of the, the real conclusions that I've come to, and I was probably predisposed to this, I, but in large scale engineering for sure, you want to have the most restrictive environment possible that I, anytime you give someone a convenience function that has any negative aspect to it, the convenience function will always be taken. And I find myself doing this. I'm painfully aware of these things where it's like, oh, a little bit of mutable state here, or I make a global singleton there. And I've lectured about why, what's bad about all of these things, but when they're possible, I still wind up going for the easy things. And I think it's like, well, I'll do, I'm in the exploratory phase. You'll rationalize it all these ways where I'm prototyping and eventually it'll be changed into something else. So, uh, and the truth is most of the time, almost never does it wind up getting changed. So I am pretty big on the sense of, I would like to have you know, more tools, more limited subsets of C and C++, uh, more restrictions. The time that I spent uh, working in Haskell, which is the, you know, that's the, I call it brutal purity. You know, there's a whole spectrum of uh, kind of functional programming and purity and strength and all that. And you've got really sloppy things like, you know, JavaScript on one end, and you go all the way through, you know, various Lisps and Scala's and things like that to Haskell kind of stakes out a position way over here, you know, brutally pure. You don't get to, to cheat and do things, you know, in general. Uh, you don't get the option of doing the lazy things. It just won't compile. And I started to do a little project in there, and I would like to have done more work with it, but it just didn't have the opportunity to kind of get out of the, the hobby level. The other kind of direction that I was looking at there were list-based things with scheme programming and some of that. And I've got to admit that there's, I, you know, there are more than purely engineering aspects that are interesting there, where Lisp is like the Ur language back there. It was in the late 50s where it was created, and it's still at least De uh, debatably relevant today. So there's something interesting about that and 
you know, the old tales of the MIT hackers. And so there's a lore behind that. And I finally did, you know, pick up and started doing some list programming a little while ago. And then I had this opportunity where last year we were doing some social stuff at Oculus and we wound up canning that work because it wasn't going to make it in time for Gear VR release. But I've always lectured about how it'd be better if most of the internet wasn't written in C and we didn't have these buffer overflow problems and all of this junk. And, and it was one of these things, again, reaching for these easy tools where I had to create a server, so I wrote something in C++ with Winsock. And this is like exactly what I shouldn't have been doing, but it was my, my tool of reference. I reached for the tool. It's like, oh, I'm going to go write a server today. I'll fire up Visual Studio and go do that. And I felt bad about that afterwards because this is exactly what I shouldn't be doing, especially for something that might be infrastructure, for something that could be important as we build towards the metaverse. So I, you know, a month or two ago, I said, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the social stuff for Gear VR commercial release. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to spec it. I'm going to do it myself if I have to make it all happen. I, so I started to look back at the stuff that I had done last year, brought it back up, and I'm like, you know, this is the perfect opportunity for me to try to go do something uh, right. So I decided, well, I'm not going to do this in C++. I could pick you know, a handful, a half dozen other languages that I might want to do. And I wound up picking Racket, which is a Lisp derivative. And I have a number of reasons that aren't all necessarily related to that. I, so I went and I wrote the server. And it was great. This was the type of thing where I had that experience of just last year doing this in C++. Clearly, this was a winning situation here. This was much more productive. I got something working better faster. But teasing apart the, the exact reasons for that are interesting, where I was programming in a mostly functional, pure style, but I still, you know, Lisp is still, it's a, a mixed paradigm language. I could still do these lazy hacks. And sure enough, I've got impure updates for, uh, for some of the stuff going on in there. And it's a dynamic, uh, strongly typed but dynamically typed language, which is interesting where it's not what I would recommend sort of from the Haskell side of things. And I've been trying to tell, it's like, OK, I got a big win. Was it because of the dynamic typing or because of the purity of the language or for these other things? And as I uh, like started doing refactoring to version 2 there, I started finding out, oh, yeah, this is why I don't like dynamic languages. And the refactoring, C++ tells you when you compile while well, you have to wait till your test suite runs there. So, Literally, this morning, I'm still working on converting that over to typed racket, which is a strongly statically typed version of that. And that seems to be going well. So this is one of the, I, I'm charmed that I had this opportunity to take one of these experimental little things rather than just continuing to armchair quarterback about this. I'm still suspecting that we're going to have to port this to something else because I don't think anybody else in, you know, in Oculus, I knows Lisp or is willing to program in Lisp or Racket there. So it'll probably get converted to Java or something, or Go maybe, at some point. Uh, but it's been a, a lovely experience. So the fact that uh, exp continuing to experiment with software engineering 25, 30 years into my, uh, my career on that uh, continues to be enlightening. Uh, this this question is actually from me. Uh, you've stated before that you've, you enjoy your time when you're rocketeering work with the, you know, the engineering work where you're lathing and constructing things out of, with your own hands. How has that impacted your work now? So the going from a, you know, as a software engineer, you make things out of thin air, you know, and in many cases you think that anything's possible because it's just, you know, a few more long nights and you can make anything happen. And software is wonderful that way. It is a magical medium. But when I got down to, uh, when I started working on aerospace side of stuff, I I got a lathe, I got a mill, I learned how to, you know, to manually turn lathes and CNC program mills. I never did get any good at welding, but I, you know, putting things together in the physical world is, is very interesting. And I think that it was, I, it's hard to tease apart exactly how it, would ha how it impacted my engineering sense, but it certainly did. I, there, are, there are more fundamental limits in the mechanical world, in the real world, when you wind up working on stuff. I, there is, you can have more of a sense of craftsmanship in some ways when you've got a physical object that you can look at and see all sides of, where in software it is very easy to just avert your gaze from the two million lines of old cruft over there that you really don't want to look at and are scared to investigate. I, it may have contributed some to, it, it, although it's interesting there was a kind of a, 
a convergence of the things there because the big thing I was doing in aerospace was trying to make it not like the big party aerospaces. I wanted to make it more like software where I would rather literally crash five rockets and have flown them and gotten the experience from that rather than to study it for five years and hope you've got a simulation that says it's going to work. I, so I was, I was rebelling against that in the aerospace side of things, but the, the permanence of the objects that you create there still probably did make me look a little bit more on the quality side of things from, uh, from the software side. And when you start thinking about rockets which are essentially guided missiles or maybe carrying people and you've got that level of safety, I would spend more time reading books about safety-oriented programming and caring about these things like caring about Haskell and formal program proofs and things like that where you say, well, okay, we make games right now and games sometimes crash and there's a certain amount of... Uh, of that that's expected and you can get Microsoft can have all of these logs about all of the crashes that the games have and blowing up in different cases and that's a trade-off that you make you say it's like well you know there's a speed of development versus perfection on the one hand you have the space shuttle development program which programs you know people program lines of code a year you know it's just it's this incredibly uh, meticulous process about you know writing a proposal to change the way things happen on three different lines and getting it reviewed and analyzing it, doing all of that. And that's one extreme and they produce you know, very reliable but still even then not completely bug-free software. And then you have the you know, move fast and break things approach which delivers real value. You'll find some engineers up on a, you know, up on a high horse saying it's like you know, that's irresponsible engineering but all that matters in engineering is the value equation there. And if you can deliver more value for your users without overwhelming them with some negatives, that can be the right thing. I mean, sloppiness, fast and loose or sloppy, can be the right way to develop things. But what bears examining is how many cases, though, how many times that's the real trade-off, where do you, have to t do you have to take on these risks to get that benefit? Do you have to uh, you know, be worried about these buffer overflow problems, be able to program in this way that's more productive? And finding the right you know, paradigms, tools to help you, or methodologies that let you still maintain much of this while getting more of that. And it's never going to be all of everything. It's always, engineering is always about these trade-offs. But a lot of it is finding local optimums. You know, finding ways that, well, I can sacrifice 20% of this to get me 50% of this. And finding the different things. And then wondering, are you in a local optimum, just moving around here, and do you have to do something radically different to get over the hill to the next better area in the next valley? So, yeah, it's, I... You know, the, the, the focus on safety consciousness there has made me care a lot more about, uh, about software purity. It's led to much of this stuff on static analysis and functional purity and strong typing, these things that, that matter to software quality, but it does always have to be balanced off against, in, against productivity. As we've seen on Twitter, you've been passing down your programming skills to your sons. Um, what do you feel is the right thing to do, the right methodology when teaching fundamental programming, problem solving constructs? So it's hard to say with a sample of one, I, you know, what wisdom I gain from something like this. And uh, I have admittedly been meandering around a little bit with different things. I, in fact, my wife has lectured me about sticking to projects a little bit more I, with my son there. I, so we spent, I, one odd thing is we spent some time with uh, like Christmas before last, my wife got me some old 8-bit Apple II computers, like what I had programmed on when I was a teenager. And there's something to that being able to just be at a prompt and, you know, type color equals one, plot five comma five, that I, you, like if you start up, if you start up learning Java and you load up Eclipse and there's like a hundred tools on there that you have no idea what, you know, what they do, and you start programming just with boilerplate and you know that don't look at any of this, write this. There's, you know, there's a worry that there's a style of learning programming that leads to kind of the derogatory term code monkey. You know, somebody that knows how to fill in the blanks and copy paste from Stack Overflow uh, and, and still get things done. I mean, most of, the world, most of the code in the world is written by code monkeys and the world revolves around a lot of that. But, you know, I certainly get this sense of my success has come from a bedrock knowledge, and I don't even advocate that for everyone. I mean, I, I know how to, to write the drivers and write the firmware that communicates with the application frameworks, that communicates with the APIs, that does the user interface, but the world doesn't need 
10 million of me doing that type of stuff. So it's not something that I even recommend is the right path for people from a career standpoint. But there is a sense of kind of wisdom and breadth of knowledge that I, I, you know, that I find valuable for that. So I think there's something to learning it all the way down at the nuts and bolts, but the, I, we've gone through some Apple programming. We did a Unity game last year, I, which you can download off of his webpage someplace. I, and this year, though, we've actually been working in Racket, which is the Lisp that I was talking about. That's one of my reasons for wanting to do a, a server-side program with it, because I'm actually kind of learning it just a few steps ahead of what I'm teaching my son uh, for doing that. And there's some, you know, there's some strong arguments for that where it's got a simplistic IDE where the, the Dr. Racket interface is, you know, professional programmers that are used to Visual Studio or Emacs or something are going to say, well, this is too crude for real use, but I'm using it professionally right now. But it's almost perfect for a beginning programmer. You've got the REPL where you can interactively do stuff. It's got a, st a debugger you can single step through. I am, so that's, I'm having, I have pretty positive things to say about that. And it's kind of a weird thing. It's like, you're, why the hell are you teaching someone Lisp in this day and age? I, but the basics about programming about, well, You've got things and you're computing objects on them and you've got state and you've got effects. It's reasonable to make graphics, you know, reasonable graphics things in. Um, probably a fair argument can be made. If somebody says you should teach people JavaScript, it's hard for me to marshal an argument against that. I mean, JavaScript is really kind of the most popular language around. You can program in your browser, you can share it with people. But I'm not a JavaScript programmer. I'm, I have no reason to become a JavaScript programmer right now. So it's not a path that I took. Uh, but JavaScript would probably be the safe conservative uh, direction to go for teaching new people things. But uh, Racket is surprisingly useful for this. And it's a very niche little thing. It comes from programming language theorists at the academic level. But it actually is a great education language as well as something that I'm having good results using professionally right now. OK, as our last question, I've intentionally chosen one that you that's extraordinarily broad. In other words, you can finish up anything that you possibly have not said yet. Uh, how do you see the gaming industry evolve in the next 10 years? So the gaming industry is a pretty big mature industry right now. And it's, I was not unhappy to be getting out of uh, the AAA gaming uh, grind where you've got multi-year projects with these huge budgets that have to be fairly conservative in a lot of ways. We're building magical things in the gaming industry. I mean, it is, you know, having done this for this time period, thinking back to the games I was playing 20 years ago, looking at what we can do today, it is mind-blowing. It is incredible. And in fact, I probably wouldn't have been able to predict 20 years ago how good games look and play in many ways are today because it has been it's like five orders of magnitude or something in power that we've been able to bring to bear on this. And it's incredible. I mean, it is really amazing. So I am happy to have been a part of taking things sort of I, you know, up to this level, but I think it's clear to everyone that we've passed the knee of the curve in terms of the cost benefits of expending additional resources on additional fidelity on graphics and audio and these other presentation things. I mean, we can, we can chart back through the console generations as these clear things that, unlike the Merc of the PC, where it's just continuously evolving. And it's, it's hard to not... It's hard to make an argument that, like this current console generation with the Xbox One and the, the PS4, that this is some mind-blowingly radically different thing without being a company shill there. They are better, no question. They're way easier to develop for. They are absolutely better in any way you want to look at it. But it's not the same kind of better that we used to be expecting with each new generation, where all of a sudden you can do things now that you just plain couldn't do before. And it was like I said earlier about the, the creative, uh, the beneficial aspects of, of limitations and how it can bring out some interesting creative aspects here. There's really nothing that you can do now that you couldn't do five years ago. You can have more polygons, better pixel shaders, and all of this stuff. But as a design standpoint of saying, what are the elements that I'm going to have in my game? How are they going to interact? You break it down to the state, you know, the state diagrams and everything. There's nothing that you couldn't have done then. And I don't think there's anything that's holding us back right now that we can say, you know, any vision that somebody spins, whatever massively multiplayer, creative, uh, user-generated content, whatever, you can cobble that all together. It might be incredibly expensive, and we are, 
You can make analogies, in fact, to, uh, to semiconductor fabs, where right now we can probably do just about anything we want in games, but it's hard to spin up another $100 million or $500 million project to take the next step and blow people's minds in a way that they haven't been by you know, World of Warcraft or Destiny or whatever other thing that has budgets of these magnitudes that are put into them. So there will be these moonshot projects where it becomes more about bringing together the financing and the team rather than the necessarily detail level design. On the other hand, it was delightful to see the, you know, the touch explosion and then the, the indie games explosions and stuff on PC. But people are finding that certainly it's a hard, it's a hard business there. You know, that's not something where you, know, you don't go out to be an indie game developer to get rich. You can't look at Notch and say, you know, I, wanna, I wanna be that, I wanna get that success there. Because it's not something that, uh, it has to be good. It's a minimum quality to deliver all of these things, but there's a lot of other factors that go into things around it. So I do think that right now, uh, virtual reality is at one of those great, stand, uh, those great points where nobody has figured out what the angry birds of virtual reality is going to be. I mean, I think the analogies are really close where touch games came into their own in many, in many ways when people started saying, oh, you really want to be doing analog swipes or lots of taps that are direct positioning on there, these things that mobile's good at. And we haven't hit that moment yet in virtual reality. And while it's very likely going to uh, race to the bottom in many ways like mobile did, and it may happen faster. I mean, we are seeing all of these technical trends accelerating in many ways, where if you look how long it took for things to happen in the PC space versus the mobile space, uh, VR is potentially going to happen even faster. I mean, maybe it'll be slower because the adoption rates will be different than phones, but I certainly wouldn't expect it to be something that it takes a decade to sort out, where in some small integer number of years, this kind of green field that's really untrammeled out there will become as, I, you know, as systematized, productized, and uh, professionalized as what we have on mainstream game development. And mainstream game development is a very professional system right now. I, the money's too large for a lot of it to be, to be done in really ad hoc, I'm, auteur-driven directions. Uh, and it's a shame in some ways. I mean, it's great. It gives us these magical games that are amazing, but it does close off the opportunity to go do random exploratory things. Uh, you can still do that to some degree in mobile, but that's getting frighteningly professional as well, where the, uh, the ones that wind up being successful are starting to have bigger and bigger budgets behind it. The VR stuff right now, though, is back in that level of everything's tiny couple-person teams. There's a few things that have significant funding that are going on but people still haven't figured it out yet. So that is exciting. I think that we can predict games. I, you know, I've said before that there are gonna be first person shooters forever now in every platform forever. It's a genre that's gonna be stable. There's gonna be driving games, flying games, fighting games, FPSs. You know, post Minecraft now we can say there are gonna be block world games forever after. It's a stable genre. I, you know, I don't think that we have figured out yet what that's going to be on the VR side. We can predict the stable genres will continue to get better. We'll, you know, it's crazy to think that we're eventually we'll see a billion dollar budget production, you know, probably in the next decade of uh, people throwing that much money into a game uh, development process and development marketing rollout, all that, which is staggering when you think about this, when it just doesn't seem all that long ago when I'm a kid putting quarters in arcade games that were made by one person at a time and we're looking at billion dollar productions or certainly billions of dollars being spent on a regular basis for all of this. So the professional conventional stuff will continue to get better. You know, we'll have people complaining about the good old days, but the reality is it'll be better then than it is now. We know the things that are good will make them better. It's a polishing job. But the exciting stuff that I can't really predict is what will be the novel new things. You know, massively multiplayer games were you know, we're a great thing. Social aspects of things are great. There's going to be some convergence of social and VR and massively multiplayer, and uh, all of this is going to come together in some magical way, and everybody waves their hand and says metaverse, but we don't know what that means yet. I am, you know, somebody's going to build things that hopefully evolve into that. I don't think it's going to be this top-down architected thing where, you know, I, I was desperately afraid that uh, we were going to sit 50 developers in a room and say, let's build the metaverse. You know, that would have been a terrible direction to go at Oculus and Facebook. So uh, hopefully it grows from things more organically than that. 
Uh, and that's the exciting stuff. I don't know where it's going to go. I've got ideas and directions that I'm pushing, which are generally more of these bottom-up things. Like you build some tightly focused thing that makes people smile, that charms them, and then you expand that out in some way rather than trying to design the grandest thing. Because we've seen lots of failures of people go out and try to, to build the grand thing that's going to be everything to everyone. And if they don't keep their eye on the ball of you've got to deliver real value to people right there, the first thing that they do had better be fun. They don't care if it's this generic space that you can build anything in. People like Minecraft because you get chased by monsters and have to go you know, hide and pull things up. They don't care at the beginning that Redstone is a Turing complete computing device there. So all of that matters on the end, but not at the beginning. So I've, I've got my directions and my opinions on the things that I push on, but hopefully it's going to be a broad, vibrant industry with lots of people participating. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you very right, much. You we really appreciate you coming. <laughs> Hold on two seconds. <laughs> on behalf of the University of Texas uh, at Dallas, I'm really thrilled that you came out today. And we have this amazing 100% ceramic mug. It's just amazing. <laughs> <Right>. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, right. really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.